Hello, welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. I cut down trees, I wear high heels, suspenders and a bra. I wish I was a girly like my old dear papa. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Brick, which came out in 2005, written and directed by Ryan Johnson. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, Brendan. He's just been called by his ex-girlfriend, Emily, who seems to be in a lot of trouble. By the time he's able to track her down, she's dead. And Brendan has to investigate this mystery and bring the person to justice. This is a very low budget film. I think it was made on a budget of about $450,000. Ooh, that's not uh, This was also Ryan Johnson's directorial debut as well. Um, Why do I know that name? Ryan Johnson? Yeah. Uh, he made Looper with Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. The time traveling one, yeah. Yeah, which I didn't think very much of. No, no. But, you know, more recently, he was the director for The Last Jedi the eighth Star Wars oh, movie. Oh, that's where I've heard his name. You know, the one, yeah. you know, let the past die and everything. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of hatred towards Ryan Johnson's Star Wars film as probably as much as there is hatred towards him and his whole Twitter backlash and him calling out man babies and people not understanding his uh, his film and his vision. Wow. And how he subverts your expectations. You know, I, I, and I, I didn't like Looper. It was one of the films that I actually managed to sit all the way through in the cinema, but I just wanted to walk out. I yeah, was just yeah. like, this is, this guy is a pretentious asshole. You know, he, he thinks his film is super smart when really it's super stupid. I just really didn't like it. Uh, I, I, I'd seen Brick, you know, a year after it come out because okay. it went to film festivals. It won a few awards uh, and a lot of people were talking about it. They were buzzing yeah. uh, about about Brick and so when I did get to see a DVD copy of the film and watched it through I didn't make it all the way through it was just like this is tedious yeah you know I've I'd studied film noir and so I get that this is emulating film noir in its entirety but that alone wasn't enough to keep me interested in this film yeah and so all these years later we've now come to revisit Brick and it is a you know a film noir in its style. It is basically taking the 1940s, 50s crime detective yeah, genre. Yeah, all the classics. And putting it into, you know, uh, an early 2000s high school. So yeah. all of the kids act like they're in this crime noir genre. And it is the, the melding of the two genres, which I think is what got a lot of people excited. But it didn't do very much for me. Yeah, this is the first time I've watched the film. And like I said, Ryan Johnson's name appears every now and again. He's no John Carpenter. I'm just going to say that. So because he's not, I don't really follow him. Um, yeah, he made the last Star Wars movie. And I went and saw it in the cinema. And I came out like, <laughs> that's as bad as Phantom Menace. That, you know, people can't moan about Phantom Menace now after watching I will the say, at least The Last Jedi is visually spectacular. Oh, oh, but when yeah. it comes oh. to script and character and everything yeah. else. Don't get me wrong, you know, visuals are absolutely brilliant, but do not get me started on that dreadnought sequence. No. I will fucking take that apart. And like Gary said, Looper came out oh, what was it, two thousand and five? Around that time. You know, I hadn't seen Joseph Gordon Levitt at that point since Third Rock from the Sun. Mm. And then all of a sudden he was in a lot of films. I mean he was in uh, Ten Things You Hate About Me. Um, obviously 50-50 50-50 uh, Mysterious Skin yeah. he was in um, uh, Hesher you know he would appear in The Dark Knight and Inception and he'd be he would be in a lot of films he's a phenomenal actor yes but for me he was also like the Sam Worthington at that point I was like <sighs> okay he's doing so many films I'm just I'm just kind of <laughs> overburdened by JGL. Hollywood's pushing this guy yeah JGL's yeah. all over my face at the moment I can't handle it and Looper was one of those films I looked at and was like I'm good. You know, Bruce Willis traveling through time, I just don't don't need it. I think I caught some of it on TV and I was just like <laughs> and just turned it off. So hearing about Brick, seeing it on the review, hearing about Ryan Johnson, I was like, okay, let's sit down and watch it. And 
I got behind this film a lot. I didn't expect to. My expectations were low. And I think that's always my problem. Is when, when I hear that, you know, a certain film is going to make me feel a certain way, I put myself into that feeling already. And then when I sit down to watch the film, it's already maybe bringing me up or putting me down. Sure. You know, depend on what the fuck it is. And with this, Joseph Gordon-Levitt starts in that little sewer looking at the dead body, you know, and it's quiet. And I'm just like... Okay, yeah. I can get behind this. That was a very good setup, you know. It uh, the camera work and the editing uh, and the sparse music really set this up. I really believed that he had a connection uh, with this this girl who has died. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, straight away, um, the intensity in his eyes. But for me as well, it was the fact that I I didn't know it was going to be nineteen forties esque no, uh, uh, noir mm -hmm. thriller. You know, I I, I had. You know, while garnering my notes for the film, I had read that in the the, the bit on on Wikipedia. But you know, whenever I hear noir, you know, my brain just goes, huh, it's <laughs> could be anything. Look at Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Blade Runner is a noir. Well, you noir know? is a is a is a French term really for uh, for a, a genre of films that are very pessimistic uh, 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 in their tone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. obviously, I don't know French either. So <laughs> so when I see it on the film, I'm like, okay. Uh, what does that mean? It's set in a high school. And then two days later, after we've seen the dead body, you know, we see Joe Scorn Levitt get this note, you know, and he goes to a phone call. Well, it does a, this phone booth. two days earlier. Two days, it? two days earlier. Yes. Um, goes to this phone booth, answers the phone. It's his girlfriend. She's, she's upset. She's given him all this information. And like I said, I'm, I'm sat down. I'm like, this is set in a high school, right? I'm expecting the American pie shit. I'm expecting a <laughs> lot more offensive, teenage language which you don't get it's very adult well that's it it's, it doesn't take you very long to realize that the language that these kids use in this film is of a 1940s crime yeah. drama oh yeah you know it uh, and that that jarred with me and it jarred with me the entire running time of the film because it's not just these two characters it's every character in this film acts like they are in the 1940s noir and it yeah. just didn't gel right i was like nobody in high school speaks like this that's the nobody that's the point though isn't it though that is the whole point uh, but it just the I, whole movie i, I, I don't yeah, it wrong. does that is I, the whole point i'm the sat film. there exactly the same i'm like this shouldn't do i it's I'm unnatural expecting, i'm expecting american pie thriller yeah. you know teenagers kind of clue uh not clueless fucking clueless i'm thinking you know um heather's style you know, I'm thinking dark humor behind it, but that's what I'm, I'm. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm expecting. What I'm getting is kind of Humphrey Bogart. You know, I'm, I'm getting Maltese Falcon. Well, there's you a, know, I'm yeah. expecting the film to go black and white at any point, and people just to start smoking cigarettes continuously. They, it doesn't, and and I felt that that. Uh, understandable it's completely jarring from beginning to end if you're if you're not ready for it and you're not ready to kind of embrace it you'll lose the film right after 10 5 10 minutes of the movie um i was ready to see where it was going to go and it just really did work it did it did gel for me because joseph gordon levitt is so intelligent it's been a couple of months it's been a while give emily my locker number a few days ago is i wrong no you know, it's been so long, I don't know your two stats. Yeah, it's been a while. Who's she been eating with? I don't know, that's um, that's hard to keep track. Is it? And he doesn't have to swear or look uh, look like he's gonna hurt somebody. He doesn't, you know, he, Brendan is, is... Well, the character of Brendan has been massively inspired by the character of Spike in Cowboy Bebop. Oh, uh, which is a you know a sci-fi animated bounty yeah, hunter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spaceships and all the lasers. Yeah, you know, kind of wanders around with his messy hair and his hands in his pockets, oh, kind of thing. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. so there's a definite correlation between the between the character types. Uh, but watching Joseph Gordon-Levitt bumble around with his hand in his pockets like he doesn't care, shuffling around, and <laughs> yeah. mum mumbling all of his lines, you don't really know what he's saying. <laughs> You know, it's just like it's either the Very audio was somewhere. really badly recorded or all the actors just mumbled their way through the script. There's literally, I'm just going to cut to this. Dirty habit she wasn't strong enough to control and a connection to the pen to keep them going. A few months pass and the next I hear the pen's raging over a certain situation with the junk I'm partial to. 
Did you understand a word of what was just said? Because I didn't. No, but in in that in its defence, that's where I would have it on subtitles, uh, because. I always have everything on fucking subtitles. <laughs> and you'll be able to read it at the bottom. And, okay, yes, uh, we didn't fully understand what they said then. I, there were a couple of parts where I had to rewind the film to hear it again. Especially when uh, Brendan is being muffled by something and he's having to talk, which is even worse. At the same time, I can't, because, like we said, there's no offensive language or, or it's not crazy, intense uh, uh, script delivery... Because it's all intelligent words, constructing this whole sentence to describe what's actually going on, that's what kind of threw me off as well. Okay. You know, I'm rewinding it again and going, oh, right, okay, he had to use that, you know, three-syllable fucking word that I have no idea existed to, to, to construct that sentence to explain exactly what he's, he's going on. I found it a lot when he's talking to The Brain, played by Matt O'Leary. Love The Brain character. You know, initially when we first meet him, you know, Brendan has got this note, which has told him to go and get the phone call from Emily. He's gotten it. He's gone to the brain. And the brain is his informant. Now, I initially, when they first met, was like, oh, this is his geeky friend. You know, his outcast friend who doesn't have any friends and just sits out. I, as the film developed, this was his, this was his contact. This yeah. was the guy he went on the streets for the information. The brain knew everybody, and if he didn't know it, it wasn't worth knowing. There is an interesting theory, and I don't know if you're aware of, that right. some people believe that uh, the brain doesn't even exist. He only exists in Brendan's mind. He does appear sometimes like that. There's a shot, I mean, spoilers, there's a shot at the end where the brain is in the background, completely phased out. Yeah. And, he, and they're talking. Nobody ever talks to the brain. Nobody well, else. Well, Laura does. Does she? Yeah, Laura. Okay. Uh, Laura, played by Nora Zetner, um, beautiful, beautiful lady. She's the lady in red that uh, Brendan meets up with at the party. And the femme fatale. The femme fatale, yes. And she's initially his contact to uh, into the underground world, which is inside the school, um, which Brendan is obviously trying to get entrance to because that's where Emily is, and Emily is seeking his help. Laura. It's very closely connected to wanting to get with Brendan. Or at least knows that Brendan is such an agent of chaos. Now he's appeared on the scene. Shit is going to fucking go down. Um, and she wants to be near him so she's not caught up in the crossfire. And she uses the brain a lot to deliver information. And at, some time, at some point during the movie, I actually got a bit confused that the brain might have been in on the whole thing. Thing. Yeah, yeah. In my first watching, I thought the brain was the pin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because we also have uh, the pl the pin played by Lucas Haas. Uh, the pin is the local drug dealer, you know, kingpin type character. And Lucas Haas, uh, I've I've seen him in quite a lot, but I can never remember exactly what it is. I he think... was in Looper. <laughs> yeah. I think he was also in Last Days. I um, might be wrong about that, but I definitely remember he was the the son in Mars Attacks who drives around with his grandmother with the, sure, with yeah. the song. And I always think he's an amazing actor. He always looks kind of strange. Um, um, but he's not a, he's not an aggressive kind of actor. Mm. So whenever you see his character, he's not going to be jumping in like Steven Scow. No. <laughs> so when he does turn up later on, it's really very, it fits very well into the 1940s aspect of this is your drug dealer boss. I couldn't believe this him. this is your detective. I couldn't believe him as the drug kingpin in this film at all. He just looked so weak. <laughs> I know. You know? Yeah, but he had he had Tugger, played by Noah Flight, his yeah. bodyguard. Yeah. Why you know, you don't have to look tough if you've got that kind of muscle. Yeah, but the the camera work didn't suggest, you know, how that he was in control of everything. Uh his mannerisms, you know, it it just felt really, really weak. Yeah. But, right, okay. I'm sorry, I have to call bullshit on, on I have to call bullshit on that. They go, there, there's, a, there's a moment in the film where um, Brendan has gone to speak to the pin. Now this is jumping quite far ahead, but he, they have this whole discussion over the kitchen table while the mum is getting them food. And yeah. I, like you, like, like you, I was initially like, I cannot believe this. How can the mum be happy to let a drug deal go down in her kitchen? This is completely, absolutely farcical. farcical. Yeah. But as the scene went on, I'm like, this is absolutely brilliant. Because none of none Brendan, the pin, and Tugger do not break eye contact with each other. It is a tense sit-down between 
the lone wolf detective, the drug dealer, and the drug dealer's fucking pimp muscle. The mum is just there, and she just walks around. She's like, here's your cornflakes, here's your juice. She kisses her son on the cheek, and she's like, she might as well say, you boys play nice now and walk off. Because it, it plays And that is life. what it felt like, is a bunch of boys playing adults. Yes. You know? No, there was no tension there. Usually when the hero and the villain are sat opposite each other, yeah, there was. You, you know, you're waiting for, for that trigger moment. And it's just not here. I didn't even... I didn't... Th it wasn't there for you. I, f I found it. It Maybe really you... wasn't. It felt flat, it felt devoid of life. And, you know, and, and by this point in the, in the film as well, I just... I realised I had no investment in any character whatsoever. I didn't even care who killed this girl at the beginning, and I really didn't care whether he found out or even, you know, avenged her. It was just like, I, I just didn't care. I really didn't. I want to keep you safe. I will say there was one scene in the film that uh, that kind of slapped me out of my stupor and was like, okay, maybe I'll get reinvested in in the film after the sequence. Okay. And, uh, you know, you have it's again, it's borrowing from the film noirs where you have the scene where uh, you know that your hero or your fall guy yeah. is explaining to a corrupt character of some description. Okay. And in this instance, it's the assistant vice principal. Oh yeah, Goodman. I love that sequence. And, and and it's played by Richard Roundtree. Yes. Who is Shaft? Yes. yes yeah. So I'm like, well, he was a police PI kind yeah, of character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was well, he's Brendan's loose. He was Brendan's loose cannon with yes. Shaft. You know, going yeah. around trying to investigate this this big mystery. Yeah. yeah. And so I kind of like, okay, I I, I get the joke again. Yeah, you know. Well, well, well yeah. it's it, it's parody. <laughs> well, it's really see, felt now, like parody. See, yeah, but now you got to be careful with your wording because you're saying that you know it's devoid of one thing, but now it's a parody, and you 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 are not liking it. No, totally yeah. get it. But the whole Richard Roundtree sequence was he is the police commissioner kind of aspect. Yeah, yeah. He is he's talking to the detective and he's like, look, something's going down. You know, something's going down. I know something's going down. We should work together. But Brendan turning around and saying to him, oh, fuck you, I told you... Well, he doesn't say fuck you because he doesn't swear. You know, three months ago I told you I wasn't working for you and I'm still telling that to you now. You know, it's like Brendan is this lone wolf detective. He's going to do this on his own. But it worked. It doesn't it because it's worked. They're in high it school. Worked. It, it worked because there was... had There had student been... Teacher. There had been no blowout um, of of the actual universe that we were supposed to be in. There was no teenagers there. They don't even go to lessons, dude. Come on. They don't even see no, other they teachers. Don't. <laughs> the school is literally just a backdrop. You could take the school out and replace it with black and white, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, any of those noir places, and it would still fit with the dialogue. The dialogue delivery... No, because the film is going with the whole, it's high school students. No, it's yes, not. Yes, it is. No, yes, it's it not. Is. No, it's not. It, you, what? It's only the backdrop. I, I say no, it's not, because that's what I was the expecting. The film is set around the high school. It's, yes, it's set around <laughs> the high school, but then look at the look at the Halloween party they go to. I had no idea where the fuck they were with the Halloween party. They got this invite to go and meet up with Laura and... He walks in and I'm like, who throws a fucking party like this? We're explained that it's the jocks. This is the upper echelon. These are the rich kids. And I'm like, no, it's not. Just like you. No, it's not. This is not a rich kid party. They, they are too well behaved for one thing. Everything's still standing. No, there's, a, there's one of the jocks who's acting out a sequence, right? Now take away the school aspect, drop that shit out the window and put your mindset in a black and white noir thriller from the 40s. The detective has just walked into your seedy ass club on the side of town and he's looking for his informant who just happens to be the lady in red. It works. I know it doesn't work for you and before you say anything, like I'm going to defend play. another thing. Bringing up the high school play, Kara who was another informant, the female informant. The, uh, the, she was another owner of the club kind of character he was seeking information for. He has, he has only a few sequences with her and he's obviously garnering information from her about <laughs> Emily's position uh, before he finds her dead body. As the film further develops though, she really wants him to obviously side with her because she knows that he's not going to like the information that he's going to get. And 
you say about the camera work, I wasn't too sure about the camera work either, but there's the shot where he throws a cup at the mirror behind Kara and it smashes. And I just thought that shot where she is sat there in her makeup with the broken mirror behind her, she's upset because Brendan is obviously very close to the end of his investigation. That it, it I, I, I apologize if you don't like it, but I don't care. That one shot was absolutely beautiful and it set up this whole noir thriller for me for this detective story. This was a bunch of amateur student actors trying to be in the A game, you know? It just felt um, phony and fake and unrealistic when there is a murder and then your characters go, yeah, we can't get the police involved. I just go, why? And there is no explanation for it other than we need to have this film. We need to have this story. So logic, reality, same, anything that yeah, makes sense yeah, is brushed that, away. All of that, yeah, all of that went out the window, but I was, or, I was already invested with that once I'd, once I'd kind of gathered that that's what I was going with. The, like you said, with no student, uh, with, with no actual 16 to 18 testosterone filled craziness happening. All logic went Noth out the window. Nothing was I mean, happening. Once he finds the body, he actually f hides the body in the sewers. No, he, t he takes the body off yeah. and, and disappears with it. And I don't know where he stores his body. Uh, you know, Emily's body turns up towards the end of the film. But as the, as the film developed and Brendan was brought into the underground seedy world of the pin and Tugger and the drug dealing, he finds out that there was a block of heroin um, that the pin had, which had gone missing and Emily had been kind of fingered for. And that possibly, or no, is the reason why she ended up dead. Well, it was the fact that it didn't go necessarily go missing, but... Oh, it was returned, yeah. It, it was returned been with. and half of it had been taken to be sold on the side and it had been made up of an inferior product. Yeah, and it had almost caused the death of, of this, other, this other guy. Um, so... Like I said, by this three quarters of the way f through the movie where the block of heroin has come into it, Brendan is getting closer to his, uh, to, to picking out who the bad guy is behind Emily's death. You know, I'm, I've given up on the whole student shit. The student stuff, like I said, is just background. You know, when he is at school, you know, he's literally on the outskirts of the school. I don't think he actually goes inside. Ever. No. You know, you no. don't even, I don't even know you, I don't even think you know what town it is or city, is it? No. It's just, it's just a backdrop. It's, it's like it's being acted out for me. But weirdly enough, as the film went on, the backdrop kind of worked. The te these teenagers pretending, like you said, pretending to be adults. It was, I was going with it. I was happy. And uh, bringing the, the drug aspect in, I'm like, now they've got this thing to chase after. You know, I, I know Brendan's going to bring all these guys down. You know, it's fucking easy to. But uh, one of the local drug dealers, Dode, who was in love with Emily after she'd broken up. Well, initially, three months before, she'd broken up with Brendan. Yeah. Gone out with Tugger, yeah. broken up with him, and now was with Dode. And so this girl was bad news. I, you know, I was just like you. I was kind of like, I'm kind of glad that she's dead. You know, the sequences that we'd had, she was literally bad news. She, you know, she calls Brendan up at the start, telling him she's in trouble. Then she has a meeting up with him and tells him to get lost and she doesn't want anything to do with him. I'm like, play with people's emotions much? And now we get to the part where Dode is about to explain to the pin that Brendan is actually using him to find out who killed Emily and Dode believes it was Brendan who killed Emily. And we start to realise that she may have been carrying a baby as well. And just as he's about to deliver that information, Tugger goes out of his fucking mind. I, I really like that actor Noah Fleiss because his over-the-top, testosterone-filled, crazy fucking henchman. You know, I, you know, I was like, I was really kind of behind. I mean, you, see, you say that there was, no, uh, there was no emotion behind some of the characters. This part where he beats the fucking shit out of Dode... Nobody stops him. I understand it. Nobody stops him. But I was kind of behind the fact of maybe this is like a play. It's all kind of being acted out. Actors on the stage, they wouldn't just... They'd let him unfold the scene. Yeah. You know, and as he unfolds the scene, he pulls out this gun and goes, blam, and just fucking shoots Dode in the head and kills him. Just before he's about to deliver the information, you're like, oh. 
you can still see the compressed gas coming out from the squib at the back of his head for <laughs> yeah. a few seconds before he goes down. Yeah. <laughs> but now Brendan really has to go uh, un underground, you know, because now there's, this de there's two dead bodies. You know, the police are starting to be in the background and he's going to use them to his advantage, he's gonna get the school involved, he knows he's gonna bring the pin down, he knows he has to bring Tugger down. He doesn't know, you're not entirely sure how he's going to do it, but if you've seen enough of these, you know this is this is what this is what he's gonna do. And it's the part where he uh, he convinces both Tugger and the pin to have their sit down meeting. Hmm. Um, in the basement, I think, of the pin's house. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, yeah, bring as much muscle as you want, you won't need it. And then you get there and there's fucking shit tons of people everywhere. And Tugger and the pin are sat down and it's just, I knew it was, I, it was so tense. I knew it was going to break down. There was no way anybody was going to get out of this fucking place alive. You know, it was, it being set up that they're all going to take the fall, but it was all set up by Brendan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't really know how the resolution played out. They were fighting in the darkness. You hear a gunshot go off as Brendan's just leaving the building. Well, Laura explains uh, later on when she meets up that um, the uh, the drug had gone missing. Mm. Um, the drug had gone missing during the, during the meeting. Somebody had found out. The gang members had started arguing amongst each other. They'd started fighting. That had all nestled into, the obviously, the meeting room. Tugger's gone completely mental. He's attacked the pin. Beating the shit out of the pen, beat him to death. Like I said, he was so weak, he was unable to defend himself. The cops have turned up because they had been called by the brain, who had been asked by Brendan to call them. The cops have turned up. Tugger's tried to shoot his way out. I think she mentions that he had been killed, but at least he'd be arrested because Brendan had put Emily's dead body into the boot of Tugger's car. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But, big twist ending here is... It was Emily the whole time. And I, th I, I really liked this ending, actually. I, I thought, it, it, like I said, I'd been going through the movie. I'd been umming and ahhing. Was it good? Was it not? The dialogue, you know, the acting. It was, you know, how was I supposed to be in this universe? It shouldn't fucking exist. And yet, here we are at the end. The detective, he's all beaten up. He's yeah. bloody, he's tired. He's gotten, he's gotten his bad guys. And here's the girl, the beautiful girl. She couldn't Who's been get chasing her. him the whole time. It took me back to the Maltese Falcon, remember, you know, with, with well, his final meeting. There's been lots of references to, you know, I mean, it's in the style of yeah, film noir, yeah, yeah, but there yeah, was yeah, lots yeah. of references that I picked up. I mean, like on outside the guy's house, there's the giant falcon. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 on, yeah. On the post yeah, box, yeah. you know, and... Uh, Brendan says says to her at one point, you know, the, the signal is long, short, long, short with the horn. Yeah. It's exactly the Maltese Falcon. Yeah. It's the whole cigarette thing that got me because you saw the car drive past at the beginning when he was on the phone yeah. and the cigarette gets thrown out the window and you just don't think it's anything. Spoilers. Um, and then there's a moment with Emily where he sees the cigarette and I was just, I was looking at the cigarette and I'm like, why does that seem familiar? And it didn't catch on. And was when he spoke to Tugger and Tugger went, I don't smoke. I went, <gasps> he wasn't driving his car. He wasn't driving. And it gets to the end. Brendan just drops that whole dialogue piece to Laura's feet about how it was her the entire time. She stole the drug, broke it down, misused it, got a guy, in, got a guy sent to hospital and Emily had been the full girl used by Laura to save her own self. But obviously Laura hadn't quite counted on Brendan getting involved and that was why she'd been so trying to get close to him. And it's the way he delivers that whole, you know, hopefully you didn't steal a block of heroin last night, which is not sat in your locker being about to be found by the police. Yeah. Or rather found by the vice principal. By the vice principal. <laughs> and it's just like, it, yeah, I just didn't even care at that point. I was, you know, I was still, I, I just, just like end. You don't have please to, man. end the film. That's fine. You know, the the pacing was so slow that the entire film was boring. That I didn't care about either of these characters. So how the resolution ended up, of course, I didn't care because it was so farcical and unbelievable. Getting to this point, it was just a drag. So yeah, it it ended.
in the most obvious way that a film noir would end, if you've ever seen the classics, you knew yeah. that she was manipulating him, that she was the femme fatale from the get-go, and that she was the villain of the film. And so him explaining it to her at the end, you know, that's like the clever Columbo moment where he pieces together all the clues. <laughs> yeah, Columbo. It was just yeah. like, it was so obvious that it just didn't, you know, that, well, it, did, was it, so it wasn't obvious? very intelligent. You, I mean, it was just pretentious. The first time you sat down and watched it, did you turn the film on, get to that moment with the girl in the red dress and go, oh, it was her? Almost, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 okay, I'll give I'll, I'll give you partially. I'll give you partially that, like I said, if you'd watched any of the classics, and you see this lady in red. The warning signs are there, basically. It, it's basically that 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 film dialogue saying, "Look, this beautiful lady in this red dress is a big no-no. You should stay away from her." And it does kind of play out really quite well with mm -hmm. the way he does try to keep away from her as much as he can yeah. all the way through the movie trying she, to be seduced by her trying yeah. to be seduced she tries to get all over him and he just he was in love with emily mm -hmm. and it's that part of the end as well i thought was really i thought it was beautifully well done where it's um laura mentions about emily being pregnant uh mentions about she was three months gone and how she couldn't be with the father because she didn't love him and you 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 if you put it together now you know it was Brendan's baby. Yeah, yeah. But it's the way Brendan just kind of stonewalls the whole thing of ah, don't care. Does she, she that, that's just, part of my problem is that he does just stonewall and don't care himself, which makes me which, go, well, I don't care which because is, which you're is a good. blank slate. Well, I, <laughs> which is good because if he had broken down at this point and burst into tears and I don't know, written, I, I might have actually Emily, believed he was I a human being. Have. It would have ruined the whole <laughs> entire film. And like I said, it plays off even better. Because when Laura disappears then, and he's watching her go, like in those classic movies where the girl's walking down in the steam on the train or the elevator or whatever, whichever one you're watching, and the brain steps in the background all phased out and says like, are we done? Is that all good? And yeah, you can go home, brain. And you just know that tomorrow, tomorrow, just another case. Just another case. <laughs> So, in favourite sequences? Yeah, I, I, I've got quite a few. I love the beatdown with the burners. You know, you got all these guys just sat around fucking smoking weed and doing drugs and whatever. And Brendan's gone there to get his first kind of information where Emily is. And he, it's... Like we said, because it's not your typical high school teenage bullshit. The fight sequence doesn't play out like your typical high school teenage bullshit. You know, he slaps him around. You know, he, he delivers this... This brilliant line of dialogue about having all of his senses working, which is a lot more than he can say for five guys who've been doing drugs. And they all completely back down. And it's like, wow. Okay, yeah. act it, act it out. I don't need to see, I don't need to see this guy's teeth and blood smashed all over the ground. Like I said, it worked as well with the gathering intel from the from the brain. You know, I like the way he was walking back and forth on the wall, talking back and forth. You know, the, the way the two of them look, they look like they aren't able to handle themselves. I love the way that Brendan's always got his glasses on. And then whenever he's getting to a fight, especially like when he's fighting the jock. Yeah. You know, he takes his glasses off and puts them in. You know, he's like, it's this attitude that I kind of have sometimes where it's like, I'm not going down until you're down. <laughs> you know, so one of us is going down. Uh, I love the, the first meeting he has with uh, Tugger when he says about uh, he wants to meet the pin. And Tugger's just beating the shit out of him. You know, I, weirdly enough, I mean, this is going to be sacrilege to you, but it did take me a bit back to the big Lebowski as well in certain situations. The whole conversation sequence between Brendan and the pin at his house with his mum having the cornflakes takes me back to when he sat in the car in the big Lebowski and he's, you know, he's just been rough handled. He's trying to keep his drink in his hand, you know, and he's got to talk to the, the it was really good. I love the whole, the, the meeting in the basement, uh, the craziness of how all that went down. Uh, just like I said, the dialogue again, the camera work really worked well. Joseph Gordon-Levitt controlled this room. You know, he had these two guys exactly where he wanted them and he just knew how this was all gonna hand out. Then there's the beat down, it's violent as fuck. You don't see it, but it still feels violent. And even though you don't see what's happening, you kind of know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I kind of knew anyway, all the way up to the point where he delivers his final dialogue piece to Laura. And I was very surprised that it was her. 
I didn't see that coming. I knew she was a bad girl and I thought they were going to get together and then when it turns out she was behind it all and he burned her just as he burned everybody else. Yes, Brendan. Fucking yes. <laughs> Despite my reservations about the film, you know, I I like first time film directors. Mm -hmm. I like low budget independent art house films. Yeah. For the most part. But this one just really just did not do it for me. But there were moments of filmmaking brilliance that I really did appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a sequence that uh, it was a bit of reverse photography where the uh, the duvet is coming down the tunnel river and then oh, splashes onto the camera. That freaked the fuck out me. When Brendan then wakes up. Yeah. That was done in reverse. They, they filmed that in reverse. So oh, it was that... basically flowing down. Because you see that tunnel a few times and obviously yeah. the water is flowing a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is where you can tell that it was reversed. Uh, but that that was very effective. Uh, there's a sequence when they're at the uh, the pin's house and the pin or tug, can't remember which one, goes through a dark doorway mm. and then Laura literally comes straight up. Yes. Like, a second later. Yes, like, yeah, it was the very pin, nice, yeah. Very nice fade there. Yeah. There was a similar thing outside when he's first coming into his like office downstairs. Mm. It's like a black hallway outside the door. And, there's, and he flicks, and he flicks the on the light. light. And there's all these bodies, all these, people, all these people just people waiting there. Yeah, there. I was like, whoa, where the fuck yeah. did they come from? So that that was a nice nice shot as well. I also really liked the shot of the uh, the oscillating fan on the ceiling. Yeah, you know, you see it spinning, and the next shot, the camera's going around with it. Yeah, it's, like, it's it's very yeah. very good. I I, I got, just want to chuck in there. I I really liked the sequence where he was in bed with Laura. And it was like they were going to have sex, but obviously Brendan's keeping his weight, but it's flicking to Emily. Yeah, yeah. It kept flicking to Emily so much, and it kept freaking me out. He hasn't out. let her go yet. Yeah. yeah. But Which it's... is why the, this, it's a personal mission for him, that he doesn't want the police involved. But I was like, but there's not enough characterization from any of the characters in the film that make me make me care for them. Mm, no. You know? There, there's no backstories where you, you get snippets of it, but there's no... There's there's no emotion connected to it. There's you know, it, but it doesn't we, spoon feed it to you. It's not what I needed. That I was gonna say. I mean, you you, you say you didn't need it, but it's I just it's needed like, something to hang myself onto these characters it's, with. But it's but it's the thing with this. I mean, like we said, we talk about Maltese folk and we talk about Blade Runner. Or we talk about the man who wasn't there. You know, these classic. We don't know their stories as soon when we're thrust into their stories. Their their lives are already into something, and we just happen to. Stumble in on it like, whoa, what's going on, guys? And then we we go along with the tale, and then we leave them alone at the end. Yeah, you know, I I, I get what you mean. I mean, I had reservations about this film. I really did. Uh, you know, I I didn't know the director until I looked down, and then before I pressed play, I was like, oh my god, where am I going from here? And I hit play, and like I said, I expected something, but got something different. And yeah. I think that's why it worked worked for me. Um, for you, you were. You expected something that it didn't deliver, and it really threw you off your game. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I saw what this. I saw this for what it was, and it was just a, you know, a pale imitation of of the film classics. And you know, yeah. I, I think Ryan Johnson is massively overrated, massively. Uh, but I will say there is a film that he edited, um, and it was a film called May. Uh, by director Lucky McKee. Okay, right. And uh, that was a you know low budget independent horror movie, and Ryan Johnson was the editor for that film. Um, and he there is a sort of Easter egg in this where May is at the Halloween party, walking past when Brendan first arrives, carrying the, a cooler behind her. Oh. And I was just like, that's a nice little know. nod uh, to a film I really did, treasure. Did he edit this one? Yeah, I don't think so. No. Oh, I was gonna say. Uh, but there work. is an, another thing that I will praise Brick for, and that is the music and the sound design. Oh, I love the song at the uh, end. The, yeah. the music was all composed and written and performed by Ryan Johnson's cousin, uh, Nathan Johnson. And it was, of course, all done in the style of film noir with the pianos, yeah, yeah, the yeah. trumpets, the violins. Yeah, it was a beautiful soundtrack. I think that's what also kept me going. It very much emulated it. I was expecting... Teenage music. I didn't get it until the credits hit when right. that when that hard rock song got in. It just went and I was just like, "Wow, yeah, I'm really behind this now." <laughs> but yeah, but it was also very experimental. They used like uh, kitchen utensils. You know, they they created their own instruments uh, for the to, to to capture the audio. And the way that it was done was that Ryan Johnson was in America filming it. Yeah, and he was you know live camming it back to his 
cousin in England, he was watching it on like a mobile phone and then making the music nice. to pair to it. Yeah, you know, so it was. Uh, That's dedication. Th that is dedication. So <laughs> I really appreciate you know all of the audio was recorded on a, apparently a broken uh, MacBook. You know, so I mean it's it's low budget, and I really love amateur filmmakers that have spent you know five to ten years trying to get their film out there well that's okay because look and they did look at i look. just don't think the final product is very good now if i have i finished my favorite scenes i've talked about yeah. the little bits of filmmaking that i thought was really good my favorite scene using you know uh, sound is when Brendan's being chased by this random guy that's pulled a knife on With the knife. Him. Oh, I and love it's, that sequence. It's the, you know, it's the yes. foot force. Yes. The foot force all yes. the way. And obviously he goes around the corner and he takes his shoes off. Yes. And then runs back at him to take him out. And the dung on the pole was yeah. pissed. Like yeah. I said, the, the sound yeah. was very, very good. It's just a shame that all the dialogue sounded like it was no, done I'm for listening. a muffler. I'm not listening, Gary. Yeah. I'm not listening. It's very, very poor. <laughs> At the end of the day, though, I absolutely categorically cannot recommend Brick. Uh, I think this film is incredibly boring, no. lifeless, and an absolute waste of time. There are no likeable characters, and there's very few interesting ones. <clears throat> there was no chemistry between any of the actors. The visuals are dull, with a few exceptions. The whole noir aspect feels lacklustre and pretentious. Nothing makes sense, uh, the pacing was slow, and there was no real payoff, emotionally or otherwise. There were some very good edits and some interesting camera work. The rest is a complete waste of time, and in such, don't waste your time with this film. Ian, I know you're going to say otherwise. <laughs> Man, I'm going to demolish everything you just said then. I'm sorry, I have watched some fucking shit in my time and this film is could be any farther from the truth don't get me wrong i i, I go wholeheartedly with my, what my friend said there about ryan johnson yes what he did with the most recent love of our lives uh, is really really bad but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a couple of gems here and there you know he was an amateur filmmaker with this he technically still is an amateur filmmaker with star wars okay but this film Gave, gave me a really enjoyable time because I just was n unprepared for exactly how he was going to deliver this film noir teenage setting. Like I said, I was initially thrown off by the high school teenage setting. It's not really there that much. Uh, I was initially thrown off by the noir aspect of the movie. It is delivered so brilliantly. Bo uh, Bogart is being fucking... He is being loved by Joseph Gordon-Levitt in this movie. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he is building his craft in this film. He's not emotional. He wasn't emotional in Inception. I fucking loved him in that. He's definitely a lot better in this than he was in, in The Dark Knight Rises. But he was getting to that point. The, the, the dialogue between him and Laura, the pin, Tugger, the brain, everything is just so on point that you don't have to be massively intelligent to get it you just have to get that the detective is investigating and he's investigating what's going on we don't know what's going on we get told what's going on the this crazy stuff that happens in the background is stuff with the mum with the cornflakes that's just like the little sprinkle of extra sugar on top the scenes were really really well done and now i've got this awkward mum there making it even more awkward Gary Woods actually say uh, that there was no emotional payoff at the end of the movie. There never is an emotional payoff with a movie. I actually find it hard to think of a noir detective movie where the detective actually gets away at the end with what he gets and all answers answered. And I'm happy with the ending. I would say Blade Runner. I haven't been happy with the ending of Blade Runner up until they made the sequel. And then I was like, okay, that's cemented what I knew. I definitely wholeheartedly recommend Brick. Um, if you've never seen a classic detective story from the 40s or 50s or the 60s, 70s or 80s or any of them over the last fucking 80 odd years, if you've looked at detective story and gone, oh, I don't really want to watch that, maybe watch Brick. Maybe you need the teenage present day aspect to bring you into those classic stories. If you love those classics, you haven't seen this one, try it out. Be wary though, it is scary territory. <laughs>
Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. It's time.